I'm Amber Stewart. You've been with ARM for 11 years, yes, and you're a principal here. That's right. Jesse Judd, you've been with ARM for 25 years, and this is the only real job you've ever had. Pretty much. And yeah. you're a director here. I am. Thank you very much for doing this, uh, coming on to talk to us about what it's like working for ARM and being architects that have really designed the fabric of Melbourne's streets, cultures, music culture, art cultures, retail and shopping centers, and just telling us how you guys do it. A real pleasure, thank you. Now there's a big um, move towards Midtown. We're sitting in your office. Where do you think this will look like in five years time, this Midtown precinct that you guys live in? Uh, well, it's certainly come of age. When we first moved in here, we called this the Beirut end of town. <laughs> so it was the Beirut end of Melbourne. Um, we also uh, had water views, which and we could see the, <laughs> see the water. Um, and now the amount of residential, you've, you've talked about the Pan Scraper, you've, um, West Side Place yeah. out there with the, mm -hmm. with the hotel structures there, um, the station. And also the city really is a continuum through to Docklands. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Docklands dream has come of age and that's the West End of the city now. Not, this is no longer West End, as you say, it's, it's, it's Midtown. Um, so the opportunities for everything to start to grow around that mass and the street life to come back. Um, maybe a bit more investment in public open space too is needed to, to cement that as well. And will this become a seven day precinct and activated at night time like the east end of town is? I think so. Um, I mean there's a lot of residential development down this end and particularly as you continue through to Dockland so people rather than be constantly moving east to get home, they'll be also moving west, so, of course. I mean, it kind of has to. Once, yeah. the, once the residential arrives and the hotels arrive, which is really cemented, yeah. then hospitality follows. Yeah. And we've noticed with those new buildings that you mentioned, they have some great food offer in, in their, on their ground floor tendencies. So. Yeah. Um, so, Postcard 3000, 25 years ago, saw an influx of people living in the CBD. There was a lot of talk last year that people no longer want to live in the CBD and they want to live in the suburbs. For people on the ground and customers, your customers who are developing apartments, is that true or will people continue to come move into the CBD? Uh, well, last year all the cards were thrown up in the air and all the rules were broken. Yeah. Um, as things start to settle, we've got a definite transition. Nothing's coming back as it was, we know that. Um, but let's, let's cast our mind forward into the future um, a little bit. Um, it's a desirable place to live because you can live economically and you don't have the, the other struggles that the outer suburb, or inner and outer suburb have, which is transport, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of convenience. The student population has disappeared, the international student population, but not for long. Melbourne's gonna become a really desirable location because it's safe. Um, it's convenient because of what we offer. So I think that's going to bounce back and bounce back really hard. Um, and that'll impact the growth of the city. Mm. And people um, want convenience and be able to, particularly if they've been, you know, if we're doing this sort of hybrid of working from home a little bit and in the office, being able to pop into the office really quickly rather than spending an hour to transit in. Um, so I can see it being a desirable place, not just for international students coming back, but also for professionals and young families. So over the last 20 years, um, Melbourne CBD has seen enormous amount of residential developments come up, particularly on the northern end of Elizabeth Street, um, West End as well. But now we're seeing apartments becoming much more than just one apartment that's yours. You open your apartment door, you live there and you leave. But it's becoming more of a community within the building. How are you guys kind of evolving and developing your plans and designs around the new apartment living? I mean, to me, it, it's, it's an interesting question. It relates to all of our disciplines, whether it's retail, whether it's apartment living, whether it's office, and it's driven by experience. What experiences are we offering the occupants? What user experience? Um, it's design that's people first, place second, buildings third. Sort of flipping the paradigm, it, it often starts with money or it starts with building, it starts with space. And that's actually the end goal rather than the, the starting point, which is thinking about um, the person, what they're interested in, what their sense of identity is, what gets them, gets them going, and generate a place outcome out of that, which then can turn into a building or a built space outcome. Uh, so it's sort of flipping that, that whole order of events and way you perceive things around. There's a real desire for people to have identity yep. and, and the local and deeply local, not just, you know, oh, here's a bit of Melbourne bolted onto the side of a global experience that you can get just about anywhere. And that again relates to retail, mm. hotels, apartments, 
wherever. So that's a real strive. And then as we try and understand what local is, it's not doing the same crap over and over again. It has got a whole series of ideas. We're constantly reinventing who we are and, and what makes Melbourne, Melbourne. So there's a whole of ideas overlay on it. Do you have an example of that? One that, a place that you really like, that really talks to you about that experience every time you show up there, has yet to let you down? Something that you designed or something that just been here for 100 years? The place in Melbourne that I go to the most and that I love is that European city wine shop precinct with the Spring Street Grocer and Siglo upstairs. It's always open, so when you're coming home from work and you need, you go, oh, well, I need something for dinner, but I don't want to eat in and grab something and go, so it's convenient. Mm -hmm. um, it's got a really great front of house and service mode. And you're out on the street, you're part of the vibe and you're part of Melbourne. You feel in it. Um, and it's eclectic. Yeah. And it's been there for And it defines Melbourne yeah. culture and it's defined by, you know, it's the, it does those two things. And really. if I want to, yeah, and if I want to take someone who's not from Melbourne, I take them there. How do you understand Melbourne in one of our big projects? Hamer Hall's a really yeah. interesting moment. And our scope there was to just reinvent this theatre, make it work acoustically and from performance. And we, we said to the, the government, the Victorian government, you're missing the point here. You've got Melbourne's best address mm -hmm. in front of the river and people want to go out and have a good time and a Melbourne experience. And we brought the whole new um, North Back frontage to the, to the river there with the retail. And they said it'll never work. No one wants to dine. And you go, hang on a minute, no one wants to dine facing north in the sunlight on the river looking at the CBD. You've got rocks in your head. Of course they do, and, and they're very successful. So how are you designing retail to look like the European, to look like Hamer Hall? What, how do you guys approach these projects to make sure that you keep the fabric of the city, but at the same time bring it into the 21st century? The buildings that are successful are so iconic and different and um, individual. And so it's those, we never design um, or regurgitate a design for another client. Our designs are always unique to the place, the context, the client and the brief. And, and I think that's reflected in our, mm. our work. And so for a successful um, you know, Melbourne hospitality or retail venue, it needs to reflect that. If people see something that's been designed for a shop in Paris, it's not Melbourne. And they've got to, in a retail world, which was your question, they've got to be able to cope with change. You know, retail is not a static environment. You know, it's not a set and forget. Um, so, uh, but buildings are permanent, or permanent, or should be permanent. Mm. You know, th this whole, um, it's not, no longer sustainable to whack up a building and throw it down again. Mm -hmm. So we've got to create buildings as really interesting structures of which new stories can continue to evolve and be told through, mm -hmm. and that's what makes retail successful. There's a lot of talk about Melbourne being oversupplied with hotel rooms. There's been a lot of hotels been delivered over the last 24 months, and going into 2020, border shut down, that exasperated the issue. Um, in your view, are there too many hotel rooms in Melbourne? And the new hotel rooms are very new and the old are very old. There's a big contrast between, so what would you tell owners of the older ones that had to remain, remain relevant and competitive? Well, that's, I mean, the first thing is cast your mind back three years. We had nowhere to <laughs> I, enough hotel I know, rooms. I know, yeah. And it was desperate. And not enough good hotel rooms too. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so we've caught up. In the middle, there's been a global pandemic that has changed the entire planet, yes. right? Um, it's going to come back. Tourism's going to come back. And, and national tourism will yeah. fill the gap that global doesn't mm. while we wait for the, mm. you know, a return to normal or the mm -hmm. new normal. Right, so I'm, I'm not that worried about overall capacity um, and that we've got a glut. The second part of your question is what does all the B-grade hotels do with their their thing and I think there's a there's a sort of a, a huge opportunity for them to get ready for what's going to happen in in 18 mm. months time as that mm. spike hits mm. and if you don't do it now you've missed the mark you know mm. all those sort of things so yeah. it's thinking about what is what do people really want mm. what is the experience that you're offering mm. the guest mm. um, and you know what what you know what is the context not what should I offer because I'm a premium hotel or because I'm a business hotel mm. or because it's cheaper to have a certain number of staff or whatnot. Mm, mm. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, yeah, because that five star is such an old fashioned idea. I mean, it, five star I think means you need to have a pool, as you said, business center, room service, gym. a particular level, a gym, a gym a a restaurant, pool, <laughs> an ironing board. 
<laughs> it's all many things. And um, what people are wanting, I think, when they come to Melbourne is the experience of Melbourne. So the make your a hotel rooms feel like you're part of the city and give a taste of flavour of that so they don't look like they could be anywhere in the world. Um, yeah. Use local designers to to do the fit outs and, and redo that rather than bringing in international hotel designers. Um, and, and not just for your tourist market or your mm. business market because they're actually the same market. Mm. Mm. People are having a night in mm. Melbourne or a night in Sydney, whatever yeah. they're going are wanting to have a good time, are wanting to experience the city at the same, same time mm. as do their work. Mm. And then they'll come back on their weekend with their family or whoever mm. and, and play in the city next time. Mm. So it's actually the same client and the same customer mm. rather than mm. this striation of the hotel business that mm. is really an old idea too. But the same has happened with office buildings. There's been a lot of new buildings being delivered the last few years and there's a lot of older buildings that are now being de downgraded to B's and C grade buildings. So what are you telling your customers who own a building that was built in the 80s or 90s or the early thousands uh, how to remain relevant and competitive without spending money that is unsustainable on refurbishing constantly? Don't do a cheap refurb and expect a whole lot more out of your product. You've seen too many B-grade offices with a cheap lobby, cheap new lobby refurb and some new carpet and lights and hope to be, turn yourself from a B-grade to a a grade because it won't, mm. won't wash. It's a nice tiles on that lift core. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these great buildings, um, the B and great, C grade buildings, have terrific bows. They've got great daylighting, mm. they're, they're often side cores. You strip them out and they can be turned into really good quality, performative environments. And tenants are wanting a, that interesting combination of, of not having to invest too much themselves, so you might have to provide a bit more but also the ability to make things their own too. So there's a there's a sort of a balance in there. And mm. authenticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. authenticity yeah. and again experience too, to offer their clients and to offer their mm. staff. Mm. You, know, you know, everyone's really competitive to keep their staff. You've got to get them out of mm. their bedrooms now and back into the workplace mm. too and offering them experience is the mm. way to do that. Mm. Offer them new ways of working and collaborating too yeah. that the old fit outs can't cope with. How do you do that and make it commercially viable? Well, yeah. maybe it's having some floors that are shared floors. And so, you know, you rent them out at a higher rate for a month and then rent them to another party. I mean, I think that's so, a, it's a really good question. And yeah. that's the sort of new models of financing, mm. not just dollars per square metres equals a rental deal. Mm. Um, yeah, there's a base rent perhaps for a certain thing. And then there's a fee for service, mm. whole provision mm. of, of goodies that a tenant mm. might want, mm. I think is, is a, a partial answer. So that question, how do you make it commercially viable? I think, and I feel that people are going, are going to quickly tire of um, people squeezing too much out of a lemon and those co-working spaces where you're getting two, two to four square metres per person mm. and paying a real premium. Mm. That kind of mood is, is, is starting to send a lot of our clients and our peers away from that model too. Mm. So there's an interesting challenge that mm. that, that market's mm. got to address too. You stopped hearing about it as much. What's your views on co-working? I think what's great about it is flexibility yep. to be able to, to um, expand and contract monthly. Um, what else is great is it offers all those kind of great front of house spaces like meeting rooms and the like, but the spaces are tiny. And I think now we're all hypersensitive to that sitting, you know, this close, you get 12, your desks are 1200 wide. Um, and you know, if you choose one of the enclosed little offices, you're sitting so close to each other, it's uncomfortable. Now, in, in you know, in light of the last year with the pandemic, so. Um, I mean, I think yeah. it's, that's part of that co-working market maturing, and those yeah. people who just squeeze too much out of that lemon, yeah. um, you know, not not thriving, and those who are getting that right balance mm. between space, mm. flexibility, yeah. base off, base offer, and yeah. then bolt-ons. Um, mm. Those those um, landlords, service providers are going to thrive. Mm. Moving the conversation back towards the Melbourne CBD, if you are both shared Lord Mayors of the city or governor, of Ma if you want those jobs, what would you do to Melbourne now to plan for the future? What's Melbourne missing? How do you make it better? How do you improve the amenity that we already have here? I think it's an opportunity to ho, um, have a look at the parks that haven't been looked at, particularly um, like Flagstaff Gardens, 
domain that haven't really had a lot of investment into their landscape architecture and um, there's an opportunity there to invest more into that green open space. Yeah, interesting, when they were laid down 100 years ago, they were quite visionary things mm. for our city. So mm. what are we doing in, in public mm. realm for the next 100 mm. years mm. is mm. a really important mm. and interesting mm. question. Mm. And then continuing that, you know, greening, we've started to green the city by the introduction of the plane trees, but down at that kind of lower level, that human, you know, pedestrian level, how are we introducing that sort of, I guess, um, undergrowth um, into the streets? and a little bit more of a real way than just planter boxes. Is there, should we have pocket parks? Should the city invest in um, actually to introducing pocket parks and well, areas? Well, let's be more, more dramatic. Yeah. Should we close the little streets from cars altogether? Perhaps, and should they yeah. become public realm, all of the little streets? Um, there's a dramatic move yeah. for, for, for the city. Take, her, take back that, that section of the street that we have been doing with dining and maybe and that's great. Go a step further. Another one for the City of Melbourne, if I was Mayor, Flinders Street Station. Yes. It's a joke. Um, it is it is our Sydney Opera House. It is our welcome to Melbourne moment. Look it's the one on the postcards, isn't it? The one on the postcards. <laughs> Let's look at Swanson Street. It's got old sushi shops, ice cream vendors, you know, potato cakes and dim sims. You know, that does not represent Melbourne in front of a, a you know, gridlock taxi rank. And on Flinders Street, it's dead for an entire city block. You know, what are we doing mm. you know, at the gateway to our city? What would you want to do? Uh, we, we've got to open that station up to a 21st century concourse, which connects right across um, the tram stop, which needs to move um, to Federation Square. So we've got a seamless public realm from the river across Federation Square, right into Flinders Street Station, barrier free. Mm. And then we need to really, really understand the retail opportunity at, at, on Flinders Street and extend that through the dead milk dock, the old news agent that's down through there, <laughs> all the way up through to Queen Street. It's just a missed opportunity. Yeah. And that's a, that's all aspects of government um, coming together, probably with the private sector. Mm. You know, it's the tra it's the metro mm. trains, it's mm. Big Track, it's City of Melbourne, mm. um, and it's the state government. For any young architects that want to get into this industry, um, what would your advice be to them? I think um, when you're interviewing someone, you want to see that they're passionate about it because architecture and, and design is um, something that um, is it's not just a job. It's part of the um, part of your everyday, and it's the way that you think and relate um, to the city that you're within and engage with it. So. Um, when you're interviewing someone or, or meeting with them, you want to see that you, there's that passion there and there's that passion to um, be innovative and think about things a little bit differently than how they've been thought about before. Um, that they um, are able to engage with ideas and have a discussion around that. I that think you're right. They've got to be brave. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, architects are futurists. We imagine what's not here. And, and that's the job. And to do that properly, you've got to be brave. There's no pussyfooting around about imagining the future. You've got to imagine something better than exists, mm. um, imagine things that aren't there, and then bring them to reality and mm. convince people to bring mm. them to reality. Uh, Amber and Jesse, thank you very, very much for sitting down to talk about your experiences and the impact you guys are having as a firm and as individuals on our great city. And thank you for everything you do. It's been really fun talking to you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, cool. Thank you.